but he believed he had to be politically shrewd to survive. So he wrote to President Monroe and he explained, here's how the American Fur Company helps the U.S. economy. He sent Ramsey Cooks, his chief agent, to Washington to talk with congressmen and even put some of them on his payroll. So he wasn't above um, buying into politics if he had to, su to survive. Now this is the history of corruption in politics as far as the free economy goes. The government does something to affect the economy. The people in the economy who are affected come into government with money to try to mediate or try to minimize that damage or eliminate it. Then, once they're in there, they might even start doing things trying to help themselves. So this is just the beginning of corruption is when the government steps in and the private economy to protect itself comes back towards the government and then they're like that. Now, not all was lost. Not everybody was completely and totally against the free economy back in this time. Other politicians came to Astor's aid. Governor, Nin Governor Ninian Edward of the Illinois Territory challenged Calhoun. Quote, For my part, I have never been able to discover, and I defy any man to specify, a solitary public advantage that has resulted from the factory system. This is not even one single solitary advantage. No one has can can show me one. Skipping down a bit, from 1816 to 1822, Congress heard from both sides and had frequent debates on the fur trade. The bill to ban private traders, Astor was pleased to learn, never made it out of House Committee on Indian Affairs, and neither did the bill to increase McKinney's subsidy to 500,000. So they were not at all amused by McKinney and his uh, ridiculous philanderings. So we're going to skip down a bit. Quote, without more government help, McKinney was in trouble. His eight factories showed a drop in fur sales from $73,000 in 1816 to $28,000 in 1819. The next year, during the debate on the licensing bill, one of his factors told him, his factors is one of the people out dealing with Indians, one of his factors told him that his trade had almost entirely ceased. With McKinney weakened, Astor took the offensive and urged Congress to abolish the whole factory system. So, McKinney attacks Astor. Astor comes back with an uh, a education blitz on the politicians and weakens McKinney. Now Astor goes in for the kill. Step one for Astor was to help Congress to see how unpopular the factories were with the Indians. Calhoun, McKinney's ally, unwittingly cooperated when, as Secretary of War, he helped authorize a congressional minister to go into Indian country and report on the Indian trade. So uh, Calhoun, who wants McKinney to win, he says, well, you know what, let's send somebody out there and talk to the Indians. Let's figure out what the hell's going on after all. Um, Jedediah Morse was his name. He was considered a neutral observer and his first-hand report would be the most systematic investigation of the government factories ever done. Morse visited most of the government factories and interviewed the men who worked in them as well as the private traders nearby. Uh, he was out there for four months. In his report he came down clearly against the factories. Um, now Morse was not completely pleased with private traders. Uh, they traded too much whiskey, he thought. Um, quote, and they gave Indians too much on credit which weakened their work ethic. But he couldn't deny their success of the want of confidence in the government expressed by the Indians in my interviews with them. In other words, whatever we can say badly about the private traders in whatever instances, that they don't like the government traders at all. The want of confidence in the government. Now, these were originally set up to trade with the Indians and establish a good uh, relationship with them to impress them and to to get their confidence in the American government and and that's what they were set up for and they failed systematically and have achieved the opposite of their goal while being a huge boondoggle wasting all kinds of money. Abolishing the factories, Morse wrote, was quote decidedly the best course. Uh, armed with the Morse report, 
Al Astor's allies in Congress moved to abolish the factories in 1822. Skipping down a bit, the Senate voted 17 to 11 to end the factories. The House soon followed, and on May 6, 1822, President Monroe signed Benton's bill. Government fur factories closed. The closing of the factories was a story in itself. The merchandise inside them was to be collected and sold at auctions around the country. In doing their work, the Treasury officials uh, were stunned at how unpopular the factory goods were. Louis Cass, this gentleman who had a batch sent to him, said, These goods were selected, I presume, as the worst and most unsaleable in the factories, and certainly they well deserve this character. They are not fit for distribution. Now, end quote. They weren't actually selected as the worst in the factories uh, and the most unsaleable. They were just goods from the factory sent to him. Uh, but that's, that's what he thought of them. Uh, continue quote a little further down. Quote, the government on its $300,000 investment received a return of only $56,000 uh, from the, all the auction of all that stuff. If Astor could make millions of dollars trading furs, how could the government lose hundreds of thousands? Critics demanded answers, and Congress formed a committee to investigate the unprofitability of the factories. Now, I just pause right there for a second. They were doing the same thing. They were trading goods for furs to the Indians and selling the furs on market. Now, you might look at that and say there's wealth available there. You just take something out of the wild, and sell it uh, to someone in civilization, you got money, and you can do something with the money. But, there's only wealth available there if you use less wealth in gathering that wealth. So, you can't just set up a system to bring in furs, and there it is. Just like you can't just set up a system to, to mine coal, and there it is. You have to have an efficient system. And the government is never good at that, are they? Just never good at that. Uh, they sifted through the mountains of records and interviewed lines of witnesses. McKinney was on the spot and had to testify, but the committee found no corruption. That's the funny thing. They didn't, they, hundreds of thousands of dollars gone, where did it go to? They got interviews from all these people and stuff, nobody had built mansions, nobody had leaked it out the sides or anything like that. Just inexplicable losses. Quote, the factory system just failed, the committee concluded, but it needed to be studied, quote, not only as a matter of curious history, but for the lesson that it teaches to succeeding legislators. Would that we could remember the lessons learned from the American fur debacle. Okay, down to the end of the chapter here. In 1834, three years before Michigan became a state, Astor quit the fur business and sold the American Fur Company. The new silk hats the factory clothes, the government restrictions on where he could trade and what he could trade and where Indians would live, all told him it was time to leave. Also, Astor was 71 years old and ready to do less strenuous work. The same skills that had made him America's largest fur trader also made him profits in New York real estate. Some of you may know more about Astor's involvement in real estate than you know about his involvement in fur. For many years he had been buying lots in northern Manhattan, developing the property and selling it at a profit. This he continued to do. He also invested in Park Theater, the Mohawk and Hudson Railroad Company, and the Astor House Hotel. By the time of his death in 1848, he had accumulated America's largest fortune, about $10 million. John Jacob Astor. That completes our section on uh, John Jacob Astor. Now, I really want to urge you to purchase this book. Uh, it turns out you can get uh, new and used copies on Amazon, I think, for $1.99 and up. I think there are 15 copies used and new when I looked today, or something like that. It's starting about $2 for this baby. So, it's Empire Builders um, by Burton W. Folsom, Jr. Because I've given you a couple of little samples out of two of the chapters. There are seven chapters, I believe. There are seven chapters, and you've only get, gotten samples from two of them. We've gotten from chapters one and two, John Jacob Astor, and uh, chapter two was about the Michigan's railroads, where they changed the constitution of Michigan. But for now, let's call it uh, quits 
on John Jacob Astor.